Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with a pet parent, a positive reinforcement dog training mentor. She's a CDBC and a CPDT KSA. She's a photographer, a hot chocolate snob. That's a first. She's an avid traveler that has visited all 50 states. She's originally from South Chicago suburbs. She went to college in Baltimore, I just learned was art school, very cool. She's a proud Marylander. She was a proud Marylander for many, many years and currently lives in Portland, Oregon. She's wife to Mark, mom to Callan. Yep. Yay, I pronounced that correctly. She's dogma to 12 year old American water spaniel Rizzo. Any any inspiration from the movie Grease? Yes, her fancy registered name is You're the One That I Want. <laughs> and she <laughs> is a curly haired, sassy brunette. <gasps> Perfect. And she's also dogma to a four year old Nova Scotia duck tolling, 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 tolling retriever Lindy. Where'd her name inspiration come from? She is, her fancy registered name is West Coast Style, and West Coast Style is a type of swing dance, and Lindy Hop is the other type of swing dancing. Oh my goodness, so you've already made the acquaintance of my guest. Her name is Sarah <laughs> McLaudry, and she is here to teach us all about care with consent. Welcome, Sarah. It's so good well, to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be able to talk about these concepts with you, for sure. Get it out I... to the masses a little more. Yes, I am excited to learn because like I said off the recording or before we started uh, recording is I'm all about consent and I'm all about giving a uh, choice to my children, but I have a hard time translating the, translating that always to pet care because they can't say no. They can't right. verbally say no. So that's oh, where I have a hard time. they say no in lots of ways. Exactly right. So we're going to navigate that kind of um, gray area between dogs and humans. But before we go any further, I want to introduce our drinking game today. Anybody participating in our drinking game, anytime you hear this word, make sure you take a drink of whatever you're enjoying, but please be sure you're over 21 in the United States of age, wherever it is you're joining us from, and please never drink and drive. It's important to always drink responsibly. So what are you having tonight, Sarah? I actually did do a fancy hot chocolate tonight um, in my avocado cup. Um, my favorite hot chocolate is Sarah Betts from uh, New York City. So. Ooh, I need to look this up. I'm, I'm not exactly a, ch uh, a hot chocolate connoisseur, but everybody else in my family is, especially my mom. So that might be a Mother's Day gift uh, waiting to happen. Yes, and part of it is if, you, if you're used to drinking like Swiss Miss, that's not what I drink no, by any means. No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Well, I'm in I'm in El Paso, Texas, so I'm right by Mexico, and I know Mexicans yes. have melting chocolate, and in Spain, yeah. hot chocolate is like this thick, thick, That's, thick thing. Yes, that is it's more like, the speed. Yes, and you like dip your churros in it, and that's how you consume the hot chocolate. You don't really drink it, so I know that Swiss Miss is like... It's like water with a little bit of sugar. Exactly. It's like corn syrup or whatever yeah. it is. Well, tonight I'm keeping it simple and keeping it local. I'm having a margarita with a little lime, a little white tequila today. I usually go with a gold tequila, but today it's a white tequila, little Cointreau, lots of ice and salt. So cheers. Thank you so much for being on the show. Mm. So I know you're very active on social media. Yeah. So I'm going to dig in to what I think is a big source of contention for most positive-based dog trainers. Mm -hmm. so we're gonna start with a game and I'm gonna call it walk of shame. So the <laughs> walk of shame we're playing today is two minutes. I'm giving you two minutes on the clock. I have my handy dandy clock right here. And you're gonna tell me all the things that annoy you about dog training on social media. Things that you've seen that just make you crazy. Are you ready to play? think so. All right, let's do it. Three, two, one, go! Babysitting on dogs, um, people using adversive techniques and getting a magic cure, uh, the dodo having rescue dogs who magically are fixed with just love, um, let's see, um, <laughs> met, uh, recalls that you can only get with a shock collar, 
So you should only allow your dog off leash ever with a shock collar on, which is not true. Um, kids doing all sorts of things to dogs that aren't appropriate. Um, and also all those challenges, like the cucumber challenge with cats, like where they're scaring cats by throwing cucumbers at them or like the disappearing trip with, or like growling, barking at your dog to see what they'll do right at their face. Um, that's terrifying, like for all of us. And I think the biggest thing is just seeing dogs who are, um, have maybe medical issues that are thought to be funny and really and like not funny at all if you know what's going on. There's like a really old meme of a cocker spaniel trying to eat its foot. And that's like a neurological seizure issue. And there's nothing funny about that. So I think you, that- You have a few more seconds if you wanna, you know, go <sighs> a little further. Just stop watching the chalk face collar, please. Everybody, just stop it. Shock based colors. That's the biggest yeah. source of contention for you. Are you active on TikTok? I am not. <laughs> I always joke that my 16 year old would be horrified when he saw me show up on TikTok. So I try to avoid it. <laughs> What's really funny is I think it's probably a good thing you're not on TikTok because oh, that would really upset you to see yeah. the, like you said, challenges, the jokes. I, uh, I, your 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 examples reminded me of how many times can you poke your cat before it gets annoyed like that's yeah. one of them like why are you going booping your cat when it's obviously annoyed and at the right. with the goal of annoying it right right on the other hand i love the like fun little like things of like what will your dog eat and like the ones where like the dog like you know like won't eat like whatever it is like blueberries and spits them out and like those are always funny yeah because my dogs will eat anything so <laughs> You know, my dogs used to eat anything and the older they get, the more they're like, mm, I don't want that. Just give me, give me the really good stuff or don't give me anything at all. All right. So you have been a dog trainer for 18 years, which yeah. is a really long time for this specific industry because science has changed so much. Approaches and I will say I've been so a professional trainer, a professional positive reinforcement trainer for 18 years. I've been in dogs much longer than that. Wow. So that is crazy to me. So, because again, like the industry has changed so much that I'm sure you have changed as a trainer right. and your approaches have changed and your clients have changed, hopefully mm -hmm. for the better. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> uh, so tell me, first of all, what are the um, CDBC and CPDT KSA stand for, for those that aren't familiar or that are watching? Sure. And I have a lot more titles beyond that. Those are just the big ones. Um, <laughs> certified certified dog behavior consultant through um, International Association of Behavior Consultants, IAABC. And then the other one is CPDT KSA, and that is the Certified Professional Dog Trainer Knowledge and Skills Assessed. That's what the S stands for. So is the CDBC, is that a specific coursework that you take and then a test or is that a test based on your experience? It's a test and case studies that you have to submit mm -hmm. and your case studies need to be uh, one where it's dog dog aggression that have caused damage, uh, human directed aggression that has caused damage. And then like the third one was like a breed specific issue or um, there's a couple other like things that you could do, but it is for people who C CDBCs are really a step above. It is people who are working with heavy behavior cases. Okay. Okay. This is yeah. not puppy pad training. No, right? not at all. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, and the test compar component is all about the science behind training and everything like that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So like I said, you've been a dog, a professional dog trainer for 18 years. How has the industry changed in that time? <sighs> it's, in so many ways. First of all, YouTube like didn't exist when I started. And so the ability for people to gather information has gone way up um, for both clients and other dog trainers. And so it's really exciting to see how, you know, you can, I'm friends with people in Sweden, I'm friends with people, you know, like all over the world, that I couldn't have been and have these type of relationships had it not been for YouTube and Facebook and things like that. Um, and really sharing a lot of great information that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So that's the good side of things. Um, the bad side of things is there's a whole lot of people because it is a completely unregulated industry that there's a whole lot of people doing out really horrible things 
in the name of training Mm -hmm. um, and that people see just maybe the end results and don't have any clue about how the person got from A to B or what fallout there is from that. Right. Or if it lasts, like, sure. Yeah, you just exactly, because yes. it got yeah, a behavior yeah. to change for a week doesn't mean that it's going to stay that right. way. And so, yeah, I came into positive reinforcement dog training through my husband's, uh, we all refer to him as Bailey Bad Lab. Um, he was my husband's service dog, actually. My husband uses a wheelchair and he was dog reactive. And the final straw was the day he dragged my husband into the back of a Volvo station wagon to try to get a dog in the station wagon. (gasps) And he was wearing at the time, which was considered horrifying. He wore a shot collar and a prong collar at the same time. And that was horrifying back in 2000. Sadly, that's actually for the balanced trainers, the norm now. How many collars can I put on the dog? Um, and so that was kind of my introduction of like, this clearly was not helping the dog. He was a trained service dog and this was only escalating. And we really thought my husband was going to be killed. So. <gasps> wow. That's terrifying. Yeah. Oh my yes. gosh. It was the, was the station wagon moving? No, thankfully not. It was in downtown Bethesda, Maryland at a stoplight and Bailey took him and Mark <gasps> off the sidewalk. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank yeah. heavens yeah. that Mark and, 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 and that okay. I was there too, to like help them get back in onto the sidewalk and everything. It was quite, yeah, that was the final straw of like something has got to change. Right. And yeah. And you, I didn't know, I, I didn't know it at the time that that was going to start my journey to become a dog trainer. So you weren't a dog trainer yet when this happened. Nope. Nope, not at all. And we took him to go see a veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Karen Overall, who was at the time up in University of Pennsylvania. Didn't know that that two and a half hour appointment was also going to change my life, but it did. That is so awesome. Is she, you consider her a mentor of yours? Yeah, definitely. I mean, she really started me off and yeah, it was amazing. That is so cool. Who am I listening to there? That is the sassy brunette who (laughs) I think is just... She normally just sleeps all day long. She's 12, has cognitive dysfunction. The time change has gotten her a little confused today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of uh, confusion over here. I have two dogs that have cognitive dysfunction and I have two young children. So you can just imagine we are all out of sorts here. Uh, Well, I need to take a break, but I want to come back and dig in more to this care with consent concept that you've come up with. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arada, and today I'm speaking to Sarah McLaudry, who is the foremost trainer when it comes to care with consent. So she's going to tell us a little bit about what this concept is, how we can execute it at home, how we can use it at home. But first we're going to kind of figure out what is consent and what isn't when it comes to our dogs. So the second game I have for you, Sarah, is what is consent? And it is a true false game. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you a scenario and you're going to tell me if it is truly consent or absolutely not consent. (laughs) You ready to play? I'm ready. I'm always ready for this. Awesome. Well, this is the thing. Some of these you might have to elaborate a little bit more because like I I said, this is something that I'm still wrapping my head around. I am all for consent in every relationship, in every scenario. That is how you build respect and relationships. But it's sometimes hard to understand. And we don't have any videos. Did you ever watch that consent video about the tea for humans? Yeah. Yeah. That is such an effective way to teach consent for humans, but I feel like we need, maybe you need to uh, put out a similar video for dog consent. Yes, okay, yep. So for those who are watching and didn't watch that video about consent, it was about tea. It was basically, you have the great intention of offering tea to somebody, but if they say no, you don't push it. If they say maybe later, you wait. Like all the scenarios about offering somebody a cup of tea, it teaches you consent that way. So let's try to make that happen here. Yeah, I will say that my 16 year old, whenever he he feels like we're pushing him, he'll always be like, I don't want your tea. (laughs) Okay, so perfect. I can't believe that resonated so much that it's like something that you talk about all the time. I need to start teaching my kids this. Like I actually, I just, as I was talking to you, I was like, I need to, 
uh, remember to show that video to my four and a half year olds because it's super effective. Okay, so here we go back to the game. So yeah. is shoving a pill into a dog's mouth then blowing in their faces so they'll swallow it is consent? No, not at all. How do we not get- even slightly. How do we get dogs to do something that we don't want them to do like that? Is it just training and positive reinforcement? And so pills, pills, it boggles my mind how people force pills in dogs' mouths. For the most part, it is so easy to give dogs medication. If you have, you know, there's, I have actually, I keep a list of like, I don't know, like 30 items that you can put pills in to get your dogs to eat them. And yes, if it tastes bad, you have to be careful and there's all sorts of stuff, but, um, there's so many techniques to get dogs to take pills that do not involve you pulling open their mouth and shoving it in. And then blowing in their nose so that they can get startled and swallow it. That was actually yeah, the tip no. from a veterinarian. Of course it was. Ages ago. Ages ago. Yes. We hope. Yes. <laughs> I don't think that veterinarian's giving that advice anymore, I hope. Uh, okay. Placing a scat mat or similar deterrent on a couch to keep my dog off of it. That's consent. No. That's just punishment. Ah, so <laughs> even though they have the choice of going up to the couch or not, it's punishment because once they do go up on the couch, they get zapped. Yep. And it's not giving them an alternative to be, you know, to, of where to, what to do. The consent part of it would be like almost on, on your side consent of like if they came up and had a behavior that they did to ask to go on the couch, that would be your consent to have them come up on the couch. Ooh, I like that. Okay, yeah. I'm a big believer in telling what you want, not what you don't no. want, right? No. Installing a doggy door so my dog can go out whenever he wants. Consent, not consent, neither. Oh, totally. I mean, I, neither, but I would say consent because they get to choose when they want to go out. They don't have to wait for you to help with that. Of course, there's always a downside of doggy doors about like critters yes. coming in and <laughs> things yes. like that, but, or dogs recreationally barking in your yard. Um, Yes, yes. We actually have tarantulas in El Paso. And the first time okay, we yeah, found no. a tarantula was on the doggy door of our patio. We don't have it open to the house. Yeah. Our The yeah. previous owners installed it. But that thing was about to go into my patio through the doggy door. And I was no, like, no, this is what no. people say about not having doggy doors. <laughs> like tarantulas, yay big. And I don't yes. mind spiders at all, but if you told me that story with a snake, uh-uh, I'm out of here. Gone. Exactly. Or any any scary yeah. animal, really. All right. Putting my dogs in a room when guests come by to keep them from interacting with strangers or interacting with, like, young children, is that consent? I would say not. That's not consent, but that's not what we look for when we talk about consent in relation to dogs. And so that is more, you know, if we have a dog who jumps on kids, that's a management issue where we're trying to make sure that the dog and the child is safe. You know, kids have to come first. I'm a mom too, and we have to make sure kids are safe. Um, I always tell clients that just because your dog is friendly and you know they're friendly, that doesn't mean your guests like dogs or even are comfortable around dogs. And so, but putting your dog away and having them scream for two hours while your guests are there, that's not okay either. It has yes. to be a trained behavior. Got it. So the consent would be that they would go willingly yes. after they've been trained to be comfortable in that specific room. Yep. Yep. So like when I go to leave the house, I go to the dog cabinet and my dogs know that when I go to the dog cabinet, it means go into actually my office here and they will get treats for coming in the office. And this is where they stay when I am not in the house. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Putting a harness on my dog to go for a walk. That can be a very slippery slope of consent. That's what <laughs> I, I was thinking. And so I actually strong, I've been doing a lot of thinking and I'm trying, I, I don't teach puppy classes anymore, um, but I really think that a lot of our body handling and consent issues actually start when dogs are young and that very first interaction that people really inappropriately put on harnesses to dogs. Um, and the reason why I, I had a friend over who's, uh, my son had a friend over who's a longtime family friend, but not a dog owner. And she was helping my son put on a harness. And I was just watching this person who didn't know anything, which would be most first time dog owners. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is why every dog hates getting their harnesses on. And, you know, you imagine you're dealing with a wiggly puppy and you're trying to snap it and then you clip their hair in it and, you know, all that stuff. So yes, um, I work a lot with teaching dogs to have consent with getting their harnesses on. 
um, and it is a easily goes down the wrong direction um, because it's a half what I call a gata. Like at some point, like I don't want to walk my dog, like my puppy who might slip their collar or be choking themselves, pulling on a flat buckle collar. I I, I feel like I've gotta get that harness on, and so that gets a little tricky too. So, from what I'm understanding, is maybe lo- training on loose loose leash walking would be an alternative to forcing yes. the harness situation. Yes, or and also training the harness. And a lot of times, right. what we'll do is actually train if the dog has what we ca- I call corrupt cue to the heart. Like they see the harness and they're like, ah. um, we will train a whole new harness and start it from the get go. Oh, nice! Like a different yeah. style of harness. Yes. Yep. Yep. Different okay. material, something like that. So that they don't associate it with the, yeah. the one that they had trauma with. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so this one's a tough one because I think there's a, there's a, when it comes to consent, I think older generations specifically have like a hard time with it. They're like, oh, my kid's not going to consent to this. And the kids right. doesn't want their diaper changed. So that does that mean you don't change their diaper? You just leave them in their dirty diaper, right? You've heard that, right? I'm sure yeah, you've yeah. heard this in terms of like dogs as well. So this right. one is inspired by those people. Taking my dog to the vet. For a checkup, even when I know he doesn't want to go. Is that consent? It is not, but that is where this all comes down to. And that falls into the category of, is it a, what I, I'll use the term gotta. Um, is it a gotta or a want? And so I know that you're Fear Free certified also, as am I. And there are times when, you know, our my, my young dog just recently cracked a molar and she had to have her tooth removed. Like that was, she had to. Like Ouch. it was not going to go well. <laughs> and, but that's a gotta versus, oh, I would like my dog's nails trimmed today. Even though you may think that's a gotta, it is never, nail trimmings are never a gotta. Mm. It can always wait until you have consent. That is perfect. Yes. And if you have a dog that hates nail trims and trips to the vets and stuff, like you said, yes. fear free professional. So fear free pets.com yes. is where you should find your vets. Your dog trainers, yes. your pet sitters, er- your groomers, everybody. Yep. Because yep. I drive 30 minutes to my fear free clinic at a lot of other clinics to go to mine. So, yes. Yes. It makes all the difference. I mean, it makes the treatments go better. They are more receptive to it. It's all better. So, I love that so much. <laughs> so, you're an advocate for <laughs> the term that you use is care with consent. Yes. So, can you define that for us in the way that you would maybe for a client? Yeah. So in the dog training world, a lot of people talk about um, cooperative care and cooperative care to me is like the gold standard. Cooperative care would be um, my water spaniel has a, what we call cooperative jugular blood draw. She sits between my legs. Hi, sassy. Um, And she knows how to hold her chin up and she stays still while she gets a blood draw. All's good. That's awesome. But guess what? Sometimes we just need consent so that they know what's going to happen. So um, a particular client dog that we have, we taught him to a traditional way of like maybe sedating a dog who's being aggressive is to push them up against a wall at a clinic. And it's pretty scary because they don't have a lot of options. But if you teach that dog how to get into this position by choice, they know what's going to happen. And then they know that somebody's going to come up and poke them with a needle and all of that, that they get to consent of, I am ready now to stand in that position and have my sedation injection happen. And so that's why I call it consent versus cooperative. I don't know how totally cooperative that dog was, but there's consent. Rizzo needs a weekly bath um, for her allergies. And I walk her out to the bathtub and I have, a, I have a whole grooming set up in my my garage. I walk her to the bathtub and there's steps into it. And I just hold her collar at the bottom of the steps. And she, when she's ready, she walks up the steps and gets in the tub herself. Does she love getting a bath? No, not at all. She kind of sits there hang doggy the whole time. She gets a <laughs> gazillion treats, but it, and she isn't tethered in the tub or anything like that. So there is consent, but not, and, and she's being cooperative, but right. it's, not this totally roses and sunshine situation. Okay. So with the example that you used, yes. so if she, if Rizzo was going to go into the tub, happy as a clam going yes. in to get her bath, that would be cooperative care. 
It, and it would be a dog who hasn't had a lot of, you know, bad experience. Like my, my water right. spaniel, like as soon as I let Rizzo out of the tub, because I've worked really hard on this tub with her, she just runs in knowing like the cookies are going to happen. Got it. And so, yeah. And so then Rizzo is the care with consent where she's like, I'd much rather be on the couch right now, yeah. but I'm going to do this because we yeah. have an agreement and an understanding yeah. that this has to happen right now. Yep. And if, if you, um, I actually just did a, a Instagram live last week doing toenails with my dogs and you can mm-hmm. actually see the difference between Lindy is a cooperative care toenail dog and where I, she puts her paw on my hand, it's all cooperative and Rizzo is a care with consent dog where I do pick her up and put her into a position, but I have a lot of things that I do before I, I don't just grab her out of nowhere and put her in position. Oh my gosh. You know what? You're making me a better pet parent and a better human parent right now, because sometimes I want my kids to be cooperative care and I get really disappointed when they're not. So (laughs) maybe I just need to understand that being in a care with consent situation is good too. Yes. And, and like, I think about like vaccines with kids too, you know, like, yeah, it's not going to be totally cooperative, but how can we, when they're ready, do it? Or what can we do to make it the least stressful as possible? Um, and things like that. Okay, perfect. So you said that dogs say no in their own way and they're like a yes. million ways. Yes. So what should pet parents be looking for when they're doing stuff and their dog displays certain behaviors or walks away? Or what are they looking for to know for a fact they don't have consent? Right. So I think people think of the big, and actually people don't even think of this as lack of consent, but growling, snapping, snarling, all of that is lack of consent. And that is actually your dog screaming for lack of consent. And that is not the polite, subtle, I don't want to do this. What we really try to look for so that your dog doesn't feel they have to go to that situation is we're looking for those smaller signals. So um, head down, the hang dog look, or... Um, they won't, they won't even approach you. You know, they won't come to you at all. They look, if they do come to you, they're looking away. They're not engaging. Um, if we're doing nails, pulling their feet away, um, maybe putting their mouth on, you know, clippers or things like that. They might not be biting you and it might, it might even be like a little gentle, like, Hey. Um, and so those are all the things. There's so many subtle, you know, tail down, hunched back, whale eye, which is when you see the little whites Mm -hmm. of their eyes, lots of lip licking, you know, that hesitation won't take food treats. That's Mm, a big one too. That's a big one. And that's like far, that's almost like screaming, right? Like when I'm shutting down and I'm not taking the sausages or whatever nasty treat you're giving me. Right. It's bad. Um, so what do you say to the pet parents who are like, my my, my dog licks me at all the, all the time. So that's not what they're doing. That's not, they're not telling me they don't like it. They're, they're loving on me. So licking and belly rubs, those are the two ones belly up are the two that get really mushy. Mm -hmm. And I say mushy because traditionally both of those behaviors are appeasement behaviors from dogs, but they are both behaviors that humans like. And so we tend to highly reinforce them. So our dog gives us a kiss. And that first kiss was actually what we call a kiss to dismiss. It's like, leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered by you. But we're like, oh, I love you too. Dogs don't (laughs) kiss because they love us. That's not what they do. It's not in their repertoire. And, but we reinforce it and we totally give them all this attention. They're like, oh, maybe this person likes when I do this. And the same thing with belly rubs. And you see belly rubs totally going the same way where we start petting bellies and they're like, wait, I was trying to tell you to stop and back away and I don't want you. (laughs) And then we reinforce it and then it gets really mushy and very confusing. (laughs) And even confusing for the dog as, as confusing for the dog as it is for us. I think sometimes too, cause they're not really sure, you know, in their, you know, repertoire, that is appeasement behavior, but now it's like, oh, but sometimes this feels good. And sometimes my person likes it and good things happen to me when I do this. So yeah, I think for both sides of the spectrum, but I definitely for children, my rule is if the dog is on their back, do not pet them. I love that rule. That's an excellent yeah. rule. My dogs are not big on belly rubs. My dogs are very yeah. confident. They like, you know, they like lean in for pets and then they walk away from them. Like they, they're not. And so that's what, where consent really, I think for most pet parents, the first way that you can work on consent with your dog to start developing that relationship is actually with petting. 
And so we pet our dogs because we got a pet. <laughs> That's what we wanted to do. <laughs> we want to pet them. And not all dogs like to be pet. And so, you know, we call it, I call it the consent testing is like you pet for up to three seconds and you pause. What does your dog do next? Does your dog mm-hmm. nudge at your hand? Does your dog lean in and like put that special spot right by you? Does your dog maybe exhale and lean the other way? Maybe they get up and walk away. What does it let, what lets us know that they're ready for more pets? And that's, I think, the very first way. And it's also a really great way for kids to start to learn about consent for themselves and for pets. Yes. Okay. So what does it look like for us as humans to request consent other than than waiting, obviously, our three seconds? Right. So um, with my dogs, I will, I, when I want pets, I will actually like ask them to come over. I will give them like little hands out, like, Hey, you want pets, right? Like, and I put it on cue, like, do you want this? And my water spaniel Rizzo does not like to be touched that way. Um, and Lindy does, and she will come up on the couch and she will like squirrel. Like she's like a pretzel dog and will like snuggle in and give you her belly. And then if you don't pet her enough, she whacks you with her paw. And so that's how I know it's not about leave me alone. It's, Hey, I want more pets. Um, and I, you know, people would be like, well, they're demanding pets. Well, guess what? She has no other way to communicate. She would like more. Uh, and so, but I think what a lot of people see as demanding behavior from dogs is really dogs trying to communicate their personal needs. And it really, that is the consent part is they're trying to communicate their needs. I had a dog socks. She died at the, uh, toward the beginning of the pandemic who would always, yeah. if you stopped petting her would paw you. And she had a paw, like twice the size of mine <laughs> and these nails that you needed like garden clippers to cut. <laughs> And she would like scratch you to continue. And yes, when we first got her, she was six months old and it was, we worked with a balanced trainer and we were told that she's dominant. Yeah. No, she just wanted some pets. You know, what's funny is the more I learn about dog training, I've been in the industry for 12 years, but I've been really with this show learning so much from dog trainers like you. The more I talk to more dog trainers, the more I learn that she was just an insecure, sweet girl that we totally mismanaged. (laughs) Yeah. And we've all been there. So like, I always tell people like, don't beat yourself up for our past mistakes. I've done it too. You know, I mean that I became a care with consent groupie advocate because Rizzo came to me at 10 as a nine week old puppy as my show dog. And she bit me, not puppy bite, bit me at about 10 or 11 weeks old when I was doing some grooming with her. And I was like, Oh gosh, how am I going to have strangers in the show ring touch my dog? If she's biting me as a puppy. Um, and she's, and she loves people. That's the other thing that's tricky about her. She acts like she loves everybody. And so, um, so yeah, I had to get really, really, really fast, figure out what I was going to do. Yeah. That's, that's interesting that so early on, you noticed that obviously people would probably have just reinforced it and created a monster. (laughs) Well, and also I think so many people, um, that's the other thing too, is for people who are watching this or listening to this, that have young dogs is, they don't necessarily grow out of if they have body handling issues and concern about things, they don't grow out of it. It only usually gets worse unless you get help. Oh, and that's, sure. and it's just, it's amazing how, um, and same with scared dogs, things like that. People that, Oh, they'll grow out. They'll grow out mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, would you agree that these things have a way of escalating rather than yes. deescalating? Especially with consent issues, because we tend to push it, push it, push it. And we don't realize sometimes how much they're trying to say, no, not right now. I mean, I see that's where a lot of issues come in households with kids, where Mm -hmm. the kids really want to pet the dog all the time, and they're not respecting those boundaries. It's a really big, um, that's where we start to see a lot of resource guarding or aggression towards the kids or snappiness or whatever, you know, you want to say, but um, definitely it's, and it's amazing if you just like, let's say your dog is laying on the couch and you want, you would like to pet it right then. And if you come up and you're like, Hey, and they look up and they like wag their tail and you put a hand out and they're like, cool. Or if I did that to Rizzo, she would probably get up and walk away. She'd be like, right. mm-hmm, no, thank you. you know? And so just don't just autom- just, especially if they're sleeping, don't just automatically go in and pet them. Even if they're sitting right next to you. A lot of dogs like to be in your presence, but they don't necessarily want to be touched by you. 
And so really taking that time to say, hey, is this what you want? Right. You know, our dogs are captive in our world. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't choose us. <laughs> like right. we chose them. We control when they go out. We control when they eat. We control so much of their life. Can they have a little bit of consent in some of their daily interactions? I love that so much. If you didn't take anything away from this 30 plus minutes, take that last (laughs) statement away from this. We control everything about them. They should have at least consent, a little bit of choice in the things that we do to them. Uh, Like petting them when they're sleeping, they might be sitting on the couch, but they're asleep. Like, can you imagine somebody just comes pet you when you're in your bed sleeping? That's so weird. (laughs) Think about every mother who's listening to this knows exactly what that feels like. Yes, exactly (laughs) right. This morning, my son woke me up like this. So I know exactly what that is. (laughs) And you probably didn't wake up really happy and fun and excited. You know, you know, I, I, it's, I've gotten used to it by now, right? Like you kind of like, (laughs) and I think our, our senior dogs probably do as well. They kind of start to learn that this is just the way these humans act. And I just, (laughs) You know, it's kind of like a moment where they say, gosh, this, this, this is what they do. This is what they do. And if I'm going to share my life with them, I guess I'm going to have to let them pet me when I'm sleeping. Um, but tell us, how can our audience learn more about you and Decisive Moment uh, Pro Consulting? So um, I do have a website, DecisiveMomentConsulting.com. I teach online uh, care with consent classes for veterinary, like a foundation. I have a membership group. I do private one-on-one sessions. It's all virtual. So you don't need to be in Portland, Oregon. Um, And that's my, really my goal with that is to reach people who don't have necessarily good positive reinforcement trainers in their area. And that was the one thing the pandemic has taught all of us is that dog training actually in many regards is a lot easier online um, and a lot less stressful for both the pet and the person if they're doing it in the comfort of their own home. So. Are you the, are you of the mindset that they should, uh, you know, master the skills without the distractions, then practice yes. them with the distractions? Yep. yep. Yeah. At the veterinary behavior clinic, I also work at, um, we are going to stay with the starting of packages online, no matter what. And then usually if, if we feel they need to come in and do some person, some stuff on in person, we have that availability, but we're really finding it's not all that often that we need it. That is so cool. Well, I just want to thank you for educating thank me you. today yes. and making the lives of dogs and their owners better. And let's have a cuddle with some consent. So cute. I love it. Well, thank no. you so much. Here's to you, you and to your uh, all the work that you're doing. It's just awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I also want to propose a toast to our executive producer, Mark Winter, for making the show possible and for to our audience for sharing your love of dog and cat with me and my awesome guests. Here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, for sure. So if you want to learn more about Covered in Pet Hair, please visit CoveredInPetHair.com or PetLifeRadio.com. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.